Hey there guys, it's Carly. Welcome back to my channel or hello if you're new here. In today's video, I'm taking you through the 10 steps you will need to check off if you want to become a high school teacher in Australia. So if that's something you're keen to watch, grab yourself a cuppa and let's get into the video. All right, a few things before we start the 10 steps. So I have been a high school English teacher now for the past nine years. This is my ninth year of teaching and I have been teaching at the one school. So what I'm going to be telling you is just really based on my experience and other people might have different experiences or might be able to provide different information. Obviously, because I'm a high school teacher, I don't really have much expertise when it comes to primary teaching. Many of these like steps that I'm going to be telling you will likely be the same for primary and high school. And I have been doing all of my teaching in the state of New South Wales. There will be slight differences from one state to the other. So make sure that you are looking up what's going to be relevant to either the state that you're living in or the state that you're looking to move into. If you are someone who is moving to Australia from overseas, make sure that you stick around till the end of this video because I have some additional tips for you guys. With that being said, let's get straight into it. So my first one, obviously you need a university degree. So most universities, at least in New South Wales, will only do a Bachelor of Education for primary teaching. So that's your four year bachelor for primary teaching. Now, if you want to be a high school teacher, you will generally need to do some sort of undergraduate degree and then a two year masters of education. Now, for me personally, I did a three year bachelor of arts, majoring in community culture and environment and minoring in English literature and then I did it wasn't a master's at that stage it was a graduate diploma of education which was one year that has now been scrapped and it's only the two-year masters that's on offer so when you do your undergraduate degree whatever subjects you major in will determine what method subjects you will get to elect for your masters. So obviously I minored in English literature, so English was gonna be one of my methods. And then I got to choose from between history or society and culture. And I decided history because society and culture is something that I would have been able to pick up and I did as um, an additional subject that I'm approved to teach anyway. So. Be strategic when you are selecting your university subjects and when you are thinking about what subjects you wanna do for your methods. You do, there is some benefit to picking more broader methods in the sense that like, uh, it will make you more versatile in what you're teaching. But then there's also a benefit to picking more distinctive methods. So for instance, I have a friend whose method subjects, the subjects they're approved to teach are textiles and history. Very interesting mix. But for her, when it comes to getting a job, if say uh, a principal at a school really wanted her, they could put in the codes requesting someone who had textiles and history subjects and they could request those specifically, which would significantly reduce the pool of applicants that the department would give them back and pretty much make it so that that principal is sort of tailoring the job just for them. So in that instance, having like very interesting or specific codes uh, that you are approved to teach is a good thing. But obviously having broader ones, you're in with a mix of like a whole heap more people, but it just, just gives you more scope to be able to move about. I'm not necessarily going to be talking about codes and additional approval in this video. Um, but if it is something that you're interested in, let me know and I can either make an additional video or answer it in the comments down below. Okay, so you've done your university degree, you've done your undergraduate and your masters, you've got your credit points and you know, it's sort of that final year where maybe you're doing your prax and you're going to be graduating this year. The next thing that you need to do is you need to apply for a working with children check. 
So your university will likely tell you to do this prior to you going out on your first prac. And when you do it while you're on prac, obviously you're not getting paid, so you can do it in a volunteer capacity. But when you're getting towards that point where you're actually wanting to get paid work, you will need to do your working with Children Check in a paid capacity. And you just go online and you do that through the RTA or Service New South Wales, and it will be an $80 fee so you do all of the online component and then you go into the service new south wales and you'll pay your 80 dollars and normally you're working with children check last you five years all right step number three and i didn't have to do this but it is something that has come in in the last couple of years before your final prac at university you will need to complete the land type test it's a literacy and numeracy test and it will cost you approximately $200. So the reason why they brought this in is they realize that uh, we're putting people into the teaching field who don't have the best literacy skills. So universities are a business and they're not necessarily worried about finding the best teachers for the job. Uh, they're worried about getting people into those seats and getting their money. So when I did my university degree to get into my course and become a teacher, you needed, it was a UAI, it's now an ATAR of 74, which is actually pretty low for a teacher, I would say. But let's say they didn't have enough people sign up to do that course that year. And the ATAR was 74, but they needed to sort of take extra people and they were taking in ATARs of 60s and ATARs of 50s. That can happen. And what that may mean is that the people who are entering courses and who are getting funneled through courses might not have the best literacy or numeracy skills. So they really wanna make sure prior to sending you out there to teach other children that you are capable in those fields and that's what that test is for. Number four, you want to apply for your NESA accreditation and you can do that through the NESA website, the ETAMS website and each year that you're a practicing teacher at the start of the year, you will need to pay $100 to continue to be accredited. I'm not gonna talk about maintenance or any of that stuff, but um, just a basic overview. Once you start teaching, if you're in like a permanent or temporary capacity, you will have five years before you need to submit your accreditation. And I believe it's seven years if you are a casual teacher, but you will need to have that ready to go before you can even start teaching. Then number five, you want to apply to be a teacher with the actual department. And that is where you will fill out all of your information and submit that, which then leads us on to number six, you will need to complete your department interview. So when I did it, you would go to one of the head offices and it would just be you and an interviewer and they would ask you a series of like five to seven questions um, and they would generally be taken from the professional teaching standards, which if you just Google national profession professional teaching standards, you can find out what they are and that should be something that you have covered during your university study. But generally the questions will be sort of around that realm. And now I believe with all of the sort of COVID things, they had transitioned into a more online capacity. Whether they're going to revert back to face-to-face, -face, I don't know, but they have the final say as to whether you are going to be a teacher with New South Wales Department of Education or not. So you do really want to prep for this interview and put your best foot forward because it could also land you a targeted grad teaching job where they basically hand you a full-time job straight away. So make sure that you are sort of prepping for that and gathering your evidence so that you have specific examples that you can talk about during your interview. Okay, so number seven, which also wasn't a thing when I first started, is you need to complete three behavioral and cognitive 
online tests. I would suggest that this is some further way to just weed out the people who really shouldn't be in the teaching profession. Um, so another step that you need to think about, I'm not sure if you can find additional information on like what this looks like online or whether it's something that will be sort of discussed at university. So I'm sorry I can't help too much with that step. After you have done all of that, you put in for your accreditation, you will be granted conditional approval. And that's kind of like interim approval. And once you have actually finished your university degree, you've graduated and you've submitted your final transcript and your results to NESA and the department, that will then be altered to provisional approval. Um, and you'll have your five years to go from provisional graduate into proficient accreditation. So you've done all of these different steps. You've got your university, you've got your online test, your department interview, working with children check, you've done your accreditation, um, you've done your land type test. Now it's actually time for you to apply for jobs. So you could do that by just handing out your resume at different schools and that's a good way to start getting casual work and start showing your face there and being someone that they can see and know what your teaching style is. And if you're happy with just casual, that's a great way to get your foot in the door. If you're looking for something more permanent, then you want to get on the Teach New South Wales website and you want to sign up for job feed. So every week they send out the job feed email and that will have in it any uh, temporary teaching contracts and also permanent jobs that you can apply for. So definitely something to keep a lookout for if you are looking to land some more permanent work. So these are the 10 steps that you need to go through even before you start teaching. It is a quite arduous process, but then when you actually get into the classroom, I'm not going to lie, the challenges will continue to arise. And if you wanna hear about some of those challenges, check out my recent come to school with me and teach a Q&A video, because I talk about that at the end. And if you want to hear more about like the different obligations daily, weekly, semesterly. Um, if you want to check out my previous how to become a teacher video, I kind of go into some of those. But basically, there is a lot more to do that just besides like showing up in the classroom and teaching the kids. Each year, the amount of admin work, responsibilities, additional just crap becomes more and more and honestly since covid the teaching profession has been incredibly stressful i've seen a lot of people be burnt out and in australia particularly in new south wales we're going through a hardcore teacher shortage at the moment so if you're entering the profession, I mean, that's great for you. You're pretty much going to be able to walk into a job, which wasn't the case when I first started. It was really hard to get work and that process of applying for temp gigs year after year was very stressful. It took me like seven years of working before I was able to get a permanent job. And so the good news for you, it should be a lot easier. Uh, the bad news is, yeah, it continues to get more stressful. The obligations continue to grow. And at present, the political kind of atmosphere when it comes to teaching is very tenuous. Uh, politicians at the moment are trying to make it increasingly harder to be a teacher and they're trying to put in a lot more restrictions that I think are going to make, if they come into fruition, are going to make a lot of people reconsider whether they want to continue to pursue this career or not. So please just keep that in mind. It is definitely uh, a big 
challenge that you are signing up for. And if you're someone that is coming from overseas, in my previous how to become a teacher video, I've had a lot of questions. And in my come to school with me videos, a lot of questions about people, particularly from African countries and India, wanting to come to Australia, move to become a teacher. The thing that I need to tell you and that you really need to consider before you uh, make that big decision is, I'm not sure how teaching as a profession is viewed and perceived in where you live. But in Australia, teaching is not necessarily a respected career. Now, obviously all of the people who are teachers, I would say respect it and take it seriously and put in all that effort to do a great job and be the best that they can for their kids. But in terms of how it's viewed by the public, the parents, the politicians, it's not necessarily something that is viewed as a prestigious career. And oftentimes in the media, there is like a lot of down talking towards the teacher profession. And if you go out to any barbecues or whatnot and say that you're on school holidays, you will likely have a lot of like nasty people saying, why do you get this many school holidays? rah 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 and just talking down to you because they don't actually understand what it fully entails to be a teacher um, you're not necessarily going to walk into a classroom and have all the kids treat you with respect or kindness um, it might be slightly better at private schools where uh, they can get they it's they're able to get into more trouble and have more consequences for poor behavior, but then there might be other downsides of that uh, teaching system as well. But certainly in public schools, they can be really rough and um, the kids can be really hardcore. Um, I have had at different stages in my career, you know, kids swear at me and call me all sorts of different things. And, um, you know, I've certainly heard stories from other people about, you know, kids showing up to their classes with weapons or trying to fight kids and, you know, different sorts of, you know, crazy antics. Um, so that's just something that you need to be prepared for. If that's not something that is common where you live, maybe you know you need to think about how you can develop thicker skin if coming to teach in australia is really something that you're passionate about i know over the last nine years of me being a teacher i have really developed thick skin um, and just try to you know learn not to take what the kids say or do personally and you know particularly if this sort of behavior or language is very foreign to you from what you know acceptable wherever you live um yeah it could be very much uh, a bit of a reality check when you first start so please just keep that in mind it's not going to be a walk in the park and i don't want to give you any like illusions otherwise I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you have any specific questions that I haven't answered here, one, go check out my study with me teacher tips playlist just in case I have addressed it in other videos or leave it in the comments down below. I might not address you in the comments, but I might start collecting all of these questions and put them into a more bigger and specific teacher Q&A if that is something you're interested in seeing. Make sure that you subscribe down below. I put out new videos every Wednesday and Saturday. With that being said, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye guys.